Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 1, verse 8, through chapter 2, verse 10, and may be found on page 43 of your pew Bible. Now a new king arose over Egypt, who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them or they will increase, and in the event of war, join with our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pythom and Ramesses for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites." The Egyptians became ruthless in opposing tasks upon the Israelites and made their lives bitter in hard service, in mortar and brick, and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed upon them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one who was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, If it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are are not like Egyptian women, for they are more vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrews you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket amongst the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying, and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses, because, she said, I drew him out of the water. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. So here's a quick recap on this little series that we've been doing about uh, Israel's origins and how we are all a part of God's unfolding story. Uh, Most Bibles agree that the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, was brought into being somewhere in the neighborhood of 600 B.C. during what's called the Babylonian captivity. And what that was is the... Uh, Babylon was the ruling power in that region during that time. And the way the Babylonians kept peace was to take the leaders out of their homelands and 
place them in the heart of Babylon so that the people that they conquered, that these peoples in these territories were less likely to rise up and cause trouble. And, you know, if the Babylonians, the rulers of Babylon, made these captive Israels feel welcome and comfortable, then, you know, maybe they wouldn't even want to go back to their homelands. You know, that was, that was their idea, at least. So the Torah, these first five books of the Bible, was a way to inspire Jewish people to get their heads out of Babylon and return to their religious and cultural roots. It challenged the folks who were getting a little too comfortable in Babylon to stay true to their faith and maybe work towards getting back to their homeland. It was uh, a reminder to the Israelites about how God chose them, how God set them apart, and how uh, God delivered them out of slavery so that they could be a part of God's ongoing story of salvation. So, if you were captive in a land that wasn't your own, like these Israelites in Babylon, can you see how a story about God delivering people out of slavery uh, would be especially inspiring, okay? So last week, we talked about how the house of Israel actually got in to Egypt. Uh, Israel heard that Egypt was storing up all this grain in preparation for a big famine that was on its way. And so when the famine finally hit, Papa Jacob, uh, is, he sent his sons to Egypt to get some grain because that, they had heard that Egypt was storing up grain. But when they got there, when these boys got there, they found out that the governor of the land was their little brother Joseph, who they tried to sell into slavery years ago. Oops, right? And so uh, after a little bit of predictable drama, then, uh, you know, things worked out. Because Joseph forgave his brothers for trying to sell him into slavery or for selling him into slavery, and they thanked God that even though the circumstances leading up to this moment were bad, the fact that Joseph was in a position of power and could actually help save his brothers and save his family and save the people back in the land of Canaan, this was good. And so uh, Joseph invited all of these refugees from the land of Canaan, uh, these people from the house of Israel, these Hebrews from the land of Canaan into Egypt, and then they settled down in a place called Goshen. Well, the Hebrew people were happy in Goshen. And what do people do when they're happy? Well, they were fruitful and they multiplied. And everything was fine because Joseph and Pharaoh were really tight, like, like family. But after Joseph and his brothers and all those original refugees died, all of a sudden a new Pharaoh came into power, and he looked around and said, where in the world did all these Hebrews come from? Like it was a revelation to him, right? And so he got all anxious, and he thought, oh my gosh, if... if they're going to outnumber us pretty soon. And if that happens, they're going to take over. And so this Pharaoh's solution to his insecurity about all of these Hebrews living in Goshen was to thin out the population. And that's where we pick up the story this week. And I think one of the hardest things for us to do uh, to try to get our heads wrapped around this story is uh, try to figure out what it was like to live under a pharaoh in 15th century B.C. Egypt. Because we don't live under a pharaoh. We aren't ruled by someone who has absolute power over us and re is revered as a god. Because we have a choice when it comes to who rules uh, our nation. We are not slaves. And so, yes, there's this cultural gap that makes it a little harder to understand how ancient people in the ancient world understood uh, their surroundings and understood how they were governed. But even though we're not slave, I imagine there are times when we feel like our lives are shaped 
by powerful forces that are beyond our control. And so I want you to try to put yourself in that mindset for a little bit as we look into this morning's scripture. Try not to see this story as a cute little story about a chubby little baby floating in the bulrushes because I know that some of you who are raised in, in, in church have that vision in your mind and it's up on a flannel board, right? Am I right? And I bet you felt pretty special if you were the person who got to put uh, Moses on the flannel board. Am I right? No, just, just put yourself in a position of powerlessness for a minute. Think of what it must have been like to live under an all-powerful pharaoh who rules by fear and intimidation. A pharaoh who expects his orders to be carried out. And if the Pharaoh or any of his rulers or any of his uh, servants or soldiers find out you are not carrying out his orders, you die. So the first thing on Pharaoh's population control agenda was to tell the Hebrew midwives, I want you to kill all the Hebrew baby boys. But the, wid the midwives, they decided, no, no, that, that's not going to happen which was outrageous because one does not just say no to the Pharaoh. One does not disobey the Pharaoh's executive orders. So Pharaoh, the, the king of the most advanced, powerful, influential empire of that time, what did he do? He probably got kind of mad. Uh, you know, the women honored God and quite honestly feared God a lot more than they feared Pharaoh. And that's what led them uh, to ignore this executive order. So the Pharaoh, when he heard about this, he sent for these Hebrew midwives, uh, Shifra and Pua, and he asked them, what are you doing? Why are you not carrying out my order?" And the, and the answer that these midwives gave him was classic. They said, listen, this isn't our fault. These Hebrew women, they're so tough that they have their babies without us. They don't need us like the um, less vigorous Egyptian women do. Uh, there, there's nothing we can do about this. And you think, wait a minute, these, these women, these Hebrew women just gave the ruler of Egypt, the ruler that used force and subjugation to keep his empire in power, they just gave him attitude. And the fact that Pharaoh didn't just kill him on the spot was stunning. These women courageously spoke to power. And the result, as the scripture says, God dealt with the midwives, dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And so Pharaoh figured that if he couldn't intimidate these Hebrew midwives, then he's going to bring everybody in on this population control agenda. Uh, he issued another executive order for anyone who came across a Hebrew baby boy to throw him in the Nile River. And so this is where the story shifts into uh, another brave he Hebrew woman. This woman gave birth to a baby boy, and she managed to hide him for three months. And so when she couldn't hide him anymore, she did what Pharaoh ordered her to do, what Pharaoh ordered all the people to do. She put him in the Nile River. She did it very gently. She made sure the baby had a watertight, floatable uh, basket to help him along, you know. And the baby's older sister, Miriam, did a very brave uh, and courageous thing, too, and risky. She followed this basket down the river and waited until it eventually floated to Pharaoh's palace. And that's when one of Pharaoh's 
brave daughters picked this up, knowing full well that this was a Hebrew baby boy. She didn't seem too concerned about her dad's insecurities or his gruesome orders because she ignored them. She even ended up hiring the baby's biological mother to nurse him and eventually took this baby as her own son, a son in the household of the Pharaoh who wanted him dead. And Pharaoh's daughter named the baby a good Egyptian name, and we know him as Moses, the great liberator of God's people. And uh, some of our women who are taking the Just Women Bible study have covered this story already. But isn't it just amazing that in a tradition that others criticize uh, for being maybe a little too patriarchal, it was brave women who made the foundational story of the Jewish faith possible. Okay, so now let's, let's go to Babylon, all right, and look at the intended audience for this story, these people who are being held captive in Babylon. Even though the story of the Exodus was an ancient part of the Hebrew people's uh, spiritual and cultural DNA, this Torah, this written collection of Israel's story, told from different traditions and brought together during a time when the captives in Babylon needed some inspiration. So, you're captive in a strange land? Hey, listen, we've been there. And with God's guidance, we made it out too. We know this because of Moses' story. And folks, if we did it then, when we were slaves, we can do it now. These brave women from different walks of life resisted power and got the ball rolling for Israel to get out from underneath Pharaoh's oppression. These women are the ones whose saving actions allowed Moses to lead his people out of slavery. They chose life over death, even at the risk of their own lives. You can too. So says the Torah to the people of Babylon. Um, so let's bring it here today. When we commit to following Jesus, we commit to being a part of a larger family and a larger of story. We say that we are all children of Abraham. Uh, and so these stories that we read aren't just the stories of some ancient people whose, whose lives we can barely get a handle on because we're so far removed from their culture. Sure, we don't know what it's like to live in captivity in a strange land like these exiles in Babylon. Sure, we don't know what it's like to live under a self-proclaimed God ruler like the Pharaoh. Uh, we see examples of this in the world. Hello, North Korea. But most of us in this room really don't know what it's like to live under those conditions. But I'd say most of us at least can relate to what it feels like to feel helpless, to feel trapped, to feel discouraged, or to feel powerless in a system where it seems that our voice doesn't even matter. But this story is meant to encourage us. It should encourage us. That's why it's here in the Torah. It shows that the actions of little people, no matter how small, can have an enormous impact. We don't know what the impact's going to be, but like the midwives, and like the baby's mother, and her sister, and Moses' sister, when we honor God over Pharaoh, when we choose life and love over personal comfort, then we too will make choices that reflect God's desires and plans. So, on one hand, we need to hear this story as little people, the little people that we are sometimes. But on the other hand, we've got to uh, acknowledge that we are also big people, especially when we look at where we are on a global scale. 
We are one of the wealthiest nations on earth. What we have in our homes, whether they're big or small, is so much more than what the large majority of the world's population has. And that, my friends, is where Pharaoh's daughter comes in. Because she was a member of the powerful elite. Um, she was born into the wealthy ruling class of that time. She had handmaidens. She had attendants. Her house was built from bricks made by Hebrew slaves. Her clothes were uh, woven probably by Hebrew women. But here in this story, written by Israelites, the ones who were being oppressed by the Egyptians, we've got an unlikely hero in Pharaoh's daughter. A blood relative of the chief oppressor. She's a hero in the story. She was a willing and voluntary part of God's saving action. So the Exodus story tells us that we are all needed. Midwives, slaves, women, children, and the powerful too. We are all invited to work in big and small ways against powers that seek to destroy people's lives. The God of the Israelites is so much, much bigger than one nation, one people, one tribe, one family. God invites all of us into uh, the unfolding story of God's liberating salvation. All of us, big or little, somebody or nobody, rich or poor, are invited to step forward and to choose life.